Good morning, ladies. Good morning. The blessing of this beer, all of you singing to the Lord this morning, but that you're able to rest. And let's go ahead and continue to read the book of First Peter and study this book verse by verse in the time that we have. We'll have four sessions today. Yesterday we covered the godly woman's hope, godly woman's hope found in our identity and the precious promises of the living hope and inheritance. Also, we've heard about uh, how to let the godly woman's tears, the godly woman's tears, how to be able to have joy when uh, joy in the skin rejoicing in the midst of trial. This morning, we'll continue and see the godly woman's privilege, the godly woman's privilege, now in verses 10 to God. We'll read verses 3 to 12 to remember what we covered last night and what we had with this morning. The word of God says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ and the death to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away and deserved in heaven for you were kept by the power of God to faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if it need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Whom having not seen, you love. So now you do not see him, yet believing, you rejoice with joy inexpressible, full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. It, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what? What manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified before him the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were followed. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent for them things which angels desire to look into. Let's pray once more before we yeah. study God's word. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We have planned to study your word. We thank you for the blessing of your word and your person revealed in your word. Please help us to see the great and wonderful things that you reveal here. So please, Lord, bless this day for your own glory. Please bless the times of the table talks where the ladies are talking together about your word and how to apply it to their lives. Please bless our interaction, our fellowship. Please use this time, especially this day, to glorify you yourself, pray the Lord. You're in the prayer. Amen. Me, but to you. So I like a good view. Um, some of those views that I've seen is um, Yosemite, Yosemite National Park in California. Very beautiful. It's very beautiful. It changes the different um, views, whether you're there in winter or summer. I've been a privilege to be able to travel to some of the Andes Mountains, South America, and see some amazing views. They're not small mountains, the Andes Mountains in South America, they're very large mountains. In, in Juan Wallace, we had a men's uh, trip to go try and climb a volcano. <laughs> then it's a tall volcano, maybe about 12,000 feet in La Catananil. And so it was, uh, there was going to be very beautiful views, very beautiful views. It was very cold trying to sleep up there at night. <laughs> the, uh, one of the beautiful views that we had is where we read our, our church around the side of a hill in Guatemala. And we can see the uh, city down below. And you should see airplanes drip um, 
dropped out a flight into the valley and land in the airport that's near the city. And it also when it's clear, you can see three different volcanoes from the from where we are in church. So what happens sometimes is when there's visitors, um, we become accustomed to the view, but the visitors are not. And so we just get ready for church. And then some people will stop us and say, wow, look at this view. So what happens when you become accustomed, you live on the mountain side, you live in the Andes mountains, and you, are, you see that view every day, it is still amazing, but because you live there, you can forget how amazing things are. And so Peter says, um, is teaching us in verses 10 to 12, he's going he's to take some um, examples, some, he's going to call some people to come alongside us and say, look at the view of the salvation that we have. Mm-hmm. This view that we have from the scripture of the greatness of our salvation mm-hmm. is so much better than any view of the natural world. So do you have eyes to see this view that's in verses 10 to 12? Peter will call three people to testify. Three groups of people. One in verses 10 to 12, the first part, 10, 12, is the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament prophets. In the middle of verse 12, we have New Testament preaching, New Testament apostles in preaching. Those who preach the gospel to us, preach the, the Bible to us, even now. And then at the end of verse 12, we have angels. So Peter calls three visitors to come and say, look at how amazing this view is. Don't become apathetic or in the midst of difficult times, forget the greatness of this salvation. So verses 10 to 12, we have the first visitor calls us the Old Testament preach. This is the main part of this verses 10 to 12, where we read, of this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully. So we consider this salvation. This salvation is what we've heard about in verses 3 to 9. In verses 3 to 9, this salvation, we have a great living hope. We have an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled. And we've had this hope, this inheritance, this, with this we rejoice, even though we'll be genuinely suffer. And so it leads us to have a greater faith in the Lord, be encouraged, have assurance, and to love the Lord Jesus Christ more. So this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched about we can know that these here, when it says the prophets, we're not just talking about uh, Old Testament, New Testament prophets. We're talking about the Old Testament prophets. Schreiner writes that in the context, you can see that that's the case. Because in these verses, he includes the scriptures that will be fulfilled in time. And the evidence, we have that evidence of the Old Testament prophets. That they would read one another's writings, like Daniel reading Jeremiah, trying to understand when it will be completed, and when the promises will take place. We have Old Testament prophets reading other Old Testament scriptures, and that the New Testament prophets knew who and when would be the one who would be coming, like the, it talks about in, in verse 11, searching what time and um, what and what manner of time. And then verse 12, there's a contrast of time, contrast of time to what we have in year verse 10. So here, verse 10, the first visitors that come and say, look at the amazing view that the Bible has given us of his salvation are the Old Testament prophets, the Old Testament prophets. And so the Old Testament prophets speak of this salvation, the grace that would come to you. And so uh, here, when we read verse, verse 10 of the grace that would come to you. This is the grace that all that, that God would give to believers at verses 3 to 5 in this hope and inheritance through Jesus Christ. We consider the resurrection that we've heard about in this great hope 
living hope that we have in verse 3. And consider how in the Old Testament that truth was taught, including Jesus said when he quoted, I am of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What God, what God said to Moses, and by saying in the present, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and, jo um, Isaac and Jacob, Jesus said, look at how the Old Testament teaches the resurrection. You have the Old Testament teaches the resurrection because he was currently speaking to Moses, saying, I am currently, right now, I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We consider what we've heard about with the inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled. I mentioned before it's about how Hebrews speaks of Abraham in Hebrews 11, verses 8 to 13, 8 to 10. Get a look at that, reach it here. In Hebrews chapter 11. Say Verses 8 to 10, we read about Abraham. It is no, knowing about the inheritance. Verse 6 10, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of the place, which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith, he dwelt in the land of promise, as in a foreign country dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him with the same promise. He waited for the city which has foundations, who the builder and maker his God. Look at how he knew there was a hope beyond the physical land. Drop down to verse 13. These all died in faith. But speaking of faith, patriarchs, Abraham, Sarah, with not having received the promises, having seen them afar off, they were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had, had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had unbetrayed return. But now they desire a better than is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he's prepared a city for them. <laughs> Look at the inheritance that the Old Testament prophets believed in. So back to first Peter. And so Abraham comes up to us and says, says, right now, God is my God. Abraham comes up to us and says that when I received this promise of a land and a seed and a blessing, I understood that it was more than simply physical fulfillment that it included a heavenly city, a greater fulfillment in Jesus Christ. And so in verse 10, it says upon the prophets, they're saying this, this salvation, the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who probably said of the grace that will come to you. Searching, if inquiring about the salvation is an intense looking into it. It expressed effort, not merely thinking. And when they search carefully, it's you, this word for search carefully is used for trying to find a, a location. Maybe you were coming here trying to find these locations, searching carefully. And so the, that's the way that the Old Testament prophets considered what they read. The prophets have inquired to search carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. So what did they search? Verse 11 describes more detail on what they searched. They search searching what or what manner of time. Many translations have searching who, which is a legitimate translation. Searching who or what. So who and what manner of time. Good. And so this is a challenge to describe looking for the Messiah, looking for the fulfillment of all of the scripture, Jesus Christ. So who or what and, and what time? Looking for their fulfillment in their time, in their day. We can see that in Daniel 12, when he speaks of the prophecies and the fulfillment. Or Habakkuk 2, 
verses 1 to 4, where they're looking for fulfillment, the scripture, and their time. And we consider Matthew 13 now, read Matthew 13, verses 16 to 17, where the Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 13, verses 16 to 17, the disciples, speaking them in the context of the, of the parable of the soils, the four soils, the parable of the sower, but speaking to them of a salvation that only God can reveal, that Isaiah to us on his spirit, that Isaiah has revealed in his word. And Jesus says, but in verses 16 and 17, but blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For assuredly, I say to you that many prophets and righteous men desire to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. So back in First Peter, we consider who the prophet searched for whom and what manner of time, and the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that were followed. So here, the Holy Spirit, called the Spirit of Christ here, the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will work in the ministry of Christ and works now to glorify Christ by showing us our sin and our need for Christ. The Holy Spirit worked then in them. It was in them indicating uh, when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. <laughs> and so we consider the prophets come up and say, I was looking to who is now revealed with greater clarity in the scripture. I was looking for what time is now revealed in a greater clarity in the scripture. And I was looking for the sufferings of Christ and the glory that would follow Again, note how Peter is speaking about suffering, humiliation, and exaltation. Throughout the letter, he continues to bring back this pattern of suffering now and glory later. That Jesus went through a ministry of humiliation and then glory. He went through a time of humiliation in his incarnation and his obedience and death on the cross. And then exaltation in his resurrection and ascension and sitting at the right hand of the Father, now interceding, sitting as the Lord of all. And so the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow leads us into this pattern that Peter gives throughout the letter of suffering now and glory later is also the path of the Christian. It's also the path of the Christian. Christ has opened that way by his salvation and power. But then he's also given us an example in our lives, in our lives. And so we have these two details here of sufferings of Christ and the glories that we follow. The sufferings are de describing here this humiliation of the Lord Jesus Christ and his salvation. It's the same thing that Jesus talked about in Luke 9 in the transfiguration. When Moses and Elijah came and they spoke together of what was going to happen in Jerusalem. And the glories that would follow, it describes the resurrection, ascension, universal authority, future revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Old Testament is filled with both of those things. It's filled with both of those things. We consider the, the sufferings of Christ, the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. There's different ways that we can begin to connect and see the, the Old Testament and the New Testament together glorifying Jesus Christ with the Old Testament giving promises of Jesus Christ and the New Testament saying these are fulfilled in Jesus Christ. We can look at, like I mentioned yesterday, we can look at the covenants and see how the Bible is organized and structured by the covenants that is, are given in the scripture. Where, God, where the Bible describes before time, the Trinity had the covenant of redemption, electing, and um, 
in ordaining Christ as mediator. And then there's also in time where God gives a role in a covenant to Adam to obey in the garden with the hope of eternal life. But Adam disobeys as our representative. <laughs> and we fall in Adam. It, and then we have the gospel preached in Genesis 3, right after that fall. And God himself preaches the gospel to Adam and Eve, and he speaks of one who will come and crush the, uh, the serpent, but his heel will be bruised. Immediately in the garden, we begin to hear of the sufferings of Christ and the victory that he would have is part of the glory that would follow. We continue with the story, and we, the gospel is given to, him, to Abraham. And the gospel is opened up in greater detail with land, sea, blessing, and all those fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And then the, the, the story continues, and a nation is formed, as in the book of Exodus, as part of the fulfillment of this, this description. And this nation is formed with the, of giving the law of God, the law of God. Not only the law of God, the moral law of God, but law of God in, in civil form, in ceremonial form. And all of these things point to the Lord Jesus Christ in this sacrificial system where you would take a lamb that would need to be, blood need to be shed and taken to the altar. And then no one could go into the Holy of Holies unless on the day of atonement, a high priest weep the blood. And so these things are describing the sufferings of Christ. And John the Baptist would say, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And so the, con the continued story of the Bible through the covenants, including the Davidic covenant, tells us of Jesus who's coming and his glory that would follow, the glories that would follow. So we can look at the covenants that we talked about last night, but we can also look at the, the offices of Christ that helps us connect Old New Testament and New Testament. Jesus is declared to be a prophet, priest, and king. Hallelujah. And so he's a prophet. He's the ultimate prophet. And all the different prophets that have come in this Old Testament scriptures who reveal God, he, not only every word is, is God, from he is the living word. The word incarnate. He is the one who's come and given us life through his words. He's the ultimate prophet. We have a prophet, a priest, and a king. He's our great high priest, who is not only the last high priest, but he is also the sac last sacrifice once and for all for sins. And he opens the way to God, where he dies on the cross as the Lamb of God, and the veil to the place of the Holy of Holies is ripped and torn in two. He ripped and torn in two and placed, and not to, to be repaired once more, not to be put up again, not to be built again, but forever to open the way, open the way to the presence of God. And so we have a prophet, a priest, and a king, Jesus Christ is the King of kings and Lord of lords. There is no one above him in authority. He has all authority and power because of who he is, but also the New Testament describes because of what he's done on the cross. And so that the Father calls him Lord. And so we can look at the Old and New Testaments and see these connections by covenants. We can see these connections um, by offices, and we can see the offices and covenants come together in the new covenant, in the new covenant where our prophet, priest, and king fulfills all of the old covenant. It says that in Hebrews 8, quoting Jeremiah, there is a new covenant that is better than the old, and where he writes his law in our hearts. And he makes us 
to be in a lesser way, prophets, priests, and kings. Prophets in the sense that we are able to speak the word of God to others. Kings and that we will reign with him in his return. And in priests that we have a intercessory ministry with the, um, to call others to Lord Jesus Christ. That we have access to the Father. And we don't need someone to be a, we don't have to go to a confessional confess. We don't have to have someone else to um, stand in mediator, other mediator to stand in our place. We have access to the Holy of Holies. Mm-hmm. And so we can look at these different things to see these, the prophets who would say, look at how now with the New Testament, all of these things are promises fulfilled. Look at the greatness of the view that we have this salvation. We can not only look at the, the covenants or we can look at the, um, the offices, but we can also look at the types of, of scripture the word of God has given us. God has given us history. He's given us poetry and wisdom. He's given us law, a commandment. Look at these different types of literature that we have. Ultimately, we have a lot of story, a lot of historical narrative. And the story all leads us to Jesus Christ. All is to say, look at our need for Jesus Christ. When we look at the book of Judges, and we see this history of a pattern of a judge is raised up, and he delivers the people, and the people rejoice, follow the Lord, and then they go back in the sin. As the Lord raises up a prophet, another a judge, another judge. And the judge is in, in the cycle, he's worse, they're worse and worse and worse. And as you read through the book of Judges, again, the, the prophets, you know, I'm sorry, the judges get worse. The sins get worse. The people get worse. And so the end, it's like Solomon and Gomorrah. Hey. And so why do we have this history? To say Jesus is the judge that we need. Jesus is the one who is the only one who could save us. When we um, try and save ourselves, even to raise up the best of the, uh, Christians, then we're not the saviors that we need <laughs> Even the best of leaders is our um, people who need the Lord. And so the history of the Old Testament says you need Jesus. You need Jesus. You need Jesus. The wisdom of the Old Testament given in Proverbs or in Song of Solomon or in Ecclesiastes says you need Jesus. You need Jesus. Wisdom that is typical, like Proverbs, is normal for everyday life, or wisdom that is atypical, like Job, and said, What happens during this, when a godly person satures? Each of these wisdom, all this wisdom says, Jesus is the incarnation of this wisdom. He's all this wisdom put into a person, and that He's the wisdom that we need. We can look at history. You know, poets, poetry, or we can look in the wisdom, or we can look at the law and the prophets. And as the law and the prophets begin to describe to us our sin and how we have broken God's law and how we are guilty and deserve the judgment of God. And Deuteronomy says that if, that if unless you obey, in the Deuteronomy and Leviticus, unless you obey everything in this, in this law, you are cursed. And Deuteronomy says that if you're so cursed that you deserve to die on a tree. And in Galatians, Paul quotes these things and says that Jesus Christ is the one who is cursed in our place on the cross of Calvary. Then the law and the prophets testify that we deserve God's wrath, but that Jesus Christ takes the wrath of all those who would repent and believe. And that he is the only one who is the, the fulfilled and obeyed the law perfectly. 
And so the prophets and the law and the prophets testify. So we can look at all these different ways in the scripture to say, look at how the Old Testament says over and over and over, you need Christ, you need Christ, you need Christ. And the New Testament says, Christ is here, Christ is here. He's fulfilled, he's sufficient, he's all that you need. And, and, and. So you, you know how you read Hebrew? Um, you'll go from left to right, and then you go from right to left. Maybe some of you can read Hebrew better than me. Yeah. Then uh, this is how you read the Bible. The Bible you read from right to left. The Bible you, the the old the New Testament prophets, Ellis, look at what they were saying in the Old Testament, and it gives such greater clarity. And here Peter tells us in the Old Testament they wanted to understand what you understand, these connections, and to see these things. Look at the greatness of the salvation you have. You see the view? If you come so, become so accustomed to the view, then you've forgotten what is before you? To see all of these amazing things? Let's get them. Well, now we, we look at uh, verse 11 here. Well, actually in the 12, let's, we get to 12. And it says, to them it was revealed. And that not to themselves, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you. So that to them, it's still talking about the Old Testament prophets. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, that the great clarity of the, all that they've written about who Jesus is, when he will come, what are the details and fulfillment of his suffering and the glory that would come in Jesus Christ. And he understood that those things are going to be clear. And so now, ladies, you have a greater view and a greater blessing than then or Moses or favor hands. You had to have a greater understanding of the Lord Jesus Christ, including in many ways than, um, than even the apostles were able to have because we'd have the completed scripture with to have the Bible, to have the, all the Bible is an amazing thing, an amazing privilege. <laughs> and so they said, it says that the, um, to them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you. Okay, so this communication, this was com God communicated to the Old Testament prophets to reveal them. It's going to be clear, clear from your position, your spot with New Testament revelation, and that the Old Testament has even greater clarity for new covenant believers, and that they were ministering for a time that was even beyond them. The grandeur and the security of the salvation has a greater clarity with all the scripture given, with all the scripture bid. And now in the middle 12, we're gonna give um, the Old Testament prophets are now moving to the side and they begin to say, look, the New Testament apostles will to preach the gospel to us. In verse 12 it says, but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. So here, this applies to the New Testament apostles. And we see the unity of the scripture and the unity of the message of preaching of Christ. Suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. Suffering and glory. This is what the Old Testament prophets preached of Jesus Christ. This is what the New Testament apostles preached to us, through the Holy Spirit, by the Holy Spirit. And so we have an encouragement to see the Spirit's work in the Old Testament, in verse 11, the Spirit of Christ, and the Spirit's work in the New Testament, to give us His Word, all centered on the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, this great hope and inheritance given in Him, that gives us hope in a time of tears. What privilege 
you have, what privilege you have. And so the last witness who comes in the end of verse 12, things which angels desire a location, such as the Old Testament prophets who desire to see these things. It's not just the New Testament prophets that preach these things to us, but the angels desire to look into these things. And so in the same way, this is described in, in Ephesians 3, where the salvation of the church is a mysterious and glorious thing to the angelic hosts, where they desire to look into these things and the salvation on God's elect in this church is put forward in front of the angels like a diamond and the light shine into the diamond and as the um, diamond acts like a prism and, and separates the light to show the splendor of all the colors that are in the light. In the same way, God takes the salvation of sinners and displays the greatness and the glory of his grace. And he displays himself and the amazing um, greatness of his grace to save sinners to Jesus Christ puts on display all of his attributes and glory. And the angels wonder at God, the greatness of God. And no angel can sing amazing grace. <laughs> but can they wonder at the um, those who can be the objects of God's grace. In Luke 15, it describes that the, um, the three stories of the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, the prodigal son. Three stories, all with the same purpose given by the same person to the same people, Jesus Christ. In the context of his ministry, the Pharisees begin to complain. Look at how he spends time with tax collectors and sinners, sinful, wicked, dirty people. And Jesus describes to them three stories that say that you don't know the heart of God. God is like the one who looks for the lost sheep or the woman who looks for the lost coin, or the father who looks for it, the lost son. And in each case, there's rejoicing, rejoicing, rejoicing. And in, in the end of each of those stories, the Lord Jesus describes in a, a little more and a little more of the rejoicing in heaven. And so that even includes in those, that those description of the end of each of the stories, the rejoicing of the angels in heaven, at the work of God at the state centers. And so Jesus sends to those who are blinded by their own self-righteousness and cannot understand why Jesus would spend time with, with people that are full of sin. And he describes, you don't know the heart of God. You don't know the understand the heart of my ministry. You don't understand the rejoicing in heaven. And so there are texts like these that helps us un to understand in a greater way. Things which angels desire to look into is this salvation of the sufferings of Christ and the glories of the Father and how by grace he makes sinners the object of his mercy to men. And so what we've done in this first session, it, in verses 10 to 12, we've gone to look at them. And you live on this mountainside. You live before this book. And because we live before this monk, we can lose sight of the beauty of the beauty that's before us. Mm -hmm. And so Peter has said, you know, when you lose sight of that is often when you're in difficult times. Mm -hmm. You lose sight of the greatness of the salvation. And so let's worship the Lord. Let's worship the Lord for this great hope that we have, the great the joy we can have in suffering because of the greatness of this privilege that we have. And so Peter has called before us three, team, three groups of people to help him. One, prophets. Two, the apostles, the Lord, New Testament prophets. And three, the angels as well. So let's consider now how to apply this, how to apply this text. So one way to apply this text is gratefulness. 
great in this. Okay, so if Isaiah, Moses, David, Jeremiah, Daniel come and say, shouldn't you be grateful? And you could be genuinely suffering, genuinely in difficult times. But still, God comes through the Old Testament and through these Old Testament prophets to say, Look, you should see the privilege that you have. You should be grateful still. You know, uh, a, good, a good phrase to learn is, you know, somebody asks, are you doing better than I deserve? And to mean it when you say it. <laughs> and it changes the way that you look at everything. The food you have, how much you're able to sleep, how long you've traveled, what sicknesses you have. If you truly understand what we deserve, like the law has said, and we really see in the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, and we should be grateful. We should be grateful people. And it's such a rebuke to see someone who has suffered so much more than us. It's even so much more grateful than to be. And so, would you become discontent over desires that you have? Remember what you've been given. Remember what you've been given. You know, I live in Central America, so I'll have to use some of these examples. So the uh, uh, sometimes when we when I visit or visit with other um, pastors from Central America, and we could, there's a there's a conference on um, much year I go to with pastors from Latin America, and we end up coming to the states and New Jersey, and then we can see all the things that are happening in the United States. Some people are seeing guys in for the first time, and see all the structure and the money and all of the things that are here. And, um, and we can kind of say, wow, look at all this organization. Look at all this. Um, it, and you can kind of, uh, but if you live here, you can say, you know, things are worse off than they were 10 years ago. Things are worse off than they were 20 years ago. You can see things going downhill. Yeah. And yet, even coming from a different place, you can say, it's still uphill for me. From where, from what, from where do I see? From my perspective, <laughs> Even with all the secularism, you, there's still met a lot of um, common grace that God has given. And so the point is, I'm giving an example of saying, in the way I live in a different ancient, uh, and then coming back here, Fergie, I could say, wow, you guys have a lot of privileges. You have a lot of privileges. That's nothing compared to Moses or Abraham coming to you and saying in suffering, look at what you've had in the scripture. Look at these promises you had. That's, um, the privileges in the United States are nothing compared to the privileges that the word God tells us to be at in Jesus Christ. Can you see that? Is it filling with gratefulness? It should it should, the greatness of our salvation from beginning to end is secure in Jesus Christ. And so um, another application is to be a faithful, hungry, humble student. Those of you who have heard Susan teach before, isn't she an exhort women about the importance of studying the word of God? Isn't she an example? <laughs> Two ladies about diligent study of the Word of God and love of the Word of Jesus Christ to bring the Word of God. All these things become clearer the more that you spend time in Scripture. You can cannot have the same stability, joy, if you don't put the glasses on. You can't see what you've had. You don't put the glasses of the Word of God on. <laughs> And so you need to spend the time in the scripture to be able to see these beautiful things. Mm -hmm. You will be able to understand how amazing it is if Daniel comes up to you and says, what privilege you have? I was trying to understand these things. And now it is so much, it is made manifestly clear by the Old and New Testament. <laughs> but if you don't spend time with Daniel, you don't know the great privilege that is. Think we should be the this. Okay, so another application is to connect what we studied last night 
we work with what we have now in this context of suffering nows and glory later. This privilege helps us to persevere. It helps us to repent, to believe the gospel every day and to see that we have no true, we have no true hope in this world. But it's only in Jesus Christ that we have true help and hope. Think of this an illustration. We have, uh, you have a nurse that is working in a military unit, and she has um, bloodied and dying men coming in, and she's trying to stop the bleeding and to try and um, save the lives of these different people that are in the midst of the war. For her to hear in the midst of all that blood and suffering and difficulty, for her to hear that there's a good purpose for this war, there's a victory that we have and a plan and the victory is coming. That helps her to be able to press on, to not sleep another night, to be able to continue to try and help and to be diligent for the work. You see, the, they see the big picture and the hope and the plan helps us to be able in the nitty and the gritty of life. We even to see there's a plan and God is working towards the greater goal. And so I hope today in this first session that you could see a godly woman's privilege, a godly woman's privilege is a great help in difficult times. The spring. Lord, we want to thank you. Thank you for giving us the encouragement to look at the great view that you've given us in the scripture. Thank you for helping us to see a privilege. Please give us eyes of faith that we would be able to see in your word and apply it to our lives in difficult times, to seeing that we're a privileged people to be objects of grace, a privileged people to be able to uh, know our Savior, Jesus Christ. Getting pretty.